Hey folks, Quill18 here, and welcome to another Unity programming tutorial for our base building game. We are working on file saving and loading, which is a pretty big topic, but uh, we're coming along well. Right now we do have it so that when we do hit save, we've got some XML being produced. Um, that actually I still have uh, this file open looks like this that just got a bit of data actually we removed that part over there so we've got sort of this structure the skeleton structure uh, up and running which is a pretty good place to be actually we are going to go rather than just uh, spit out the file data in the debug log we are going to store that somewhere and we're going to store it in the user prefs and then we're going to see about uh, loading from there so we're going to go into scripts mm, controllers world controller, so that is responsible for initiating the file saving. I mean, we could have a sort of like a, a file manager, a file con saving controller or some damn thing, but I think the world controller is a perfectly good place to put that in here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mm. Um, and save world. Okay, so in save world, we are creating our serializer and our writer. We're asking our serializer to serialize our world data and stuff it inside the writer, which is there. And that just generates a string right now. It's not saving it to a file or anything like that. Um, so to save it, well, I mean, we could, you know, open up a file system and we're going to do that thing later on, probably much later on, uh, because there's a bunch of issues to deal with. But for now, we can just save it in the player prefs. And as I mentioned at the end of the last video, the player prefs is a very easy way to store persistent data. It also works perfectly fine on the web and in the WebGL player, as well as um, Windows, Mac, uh, mobile devices, so on and so forth, which all have slightly different int intricacies when it comes to saving files that in particular the web stuff generally can't access your file system um, so really you're limited to just these player prefs effectively but um, and these will persist between sessions so they are tied to your particular executable um, actually I don't know if it's tied to your file name no, it's based on, uh, it's a file in your player press, depending on your actual uh, application, that is based on the unity.companyname.productName, um, which is something that you set in your application data. We can look at that. Actually, we could look at that right now. Do we set that here? Any player? Oh, yeah, right up here. Yeah, so in the player settings at the top, so not, none of these things. Right here, it's got the company name and project porcupine. If you change this, it will disconnect you from your current player prep. So you want to make sure um, that that's all set correctly. Like if you if you come out between versions, if you go from version 1 of your application to version 1.1, and at some point you change your company name or product name in here, it will break all the, the saves. So that's the thing with the player preps over there. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, so set string. Takes two parameters, takes a key, and takes a value. So for now, we're just going to have a single save game. Tell you what, I'll name it save game 00. We could use this to implement multiple save game slots, or again, there might be a more sophisticated system that we'll design later for now. We'll call that good enough. And for the value, we'll just put writer.toString. Now, the Unity documentation does not list anything about a size limit for your total player preps or any particular key in here. As far as I can tell, it. Oh, no, sorry, that's wrong. The web player one is limited to one megabyte. Um, uh, you can, I don't know if you can change that in your web browser or for the plugin, but that, that is the web player. I don't know if that affects the web GL at all. Um, and I don't know. Um, and I think standalone versions don't have that limit. In any case, we're not going to use this forever going forward. We're going to have a proper file system thing or, or something. We'll figure that out. But for now, this should be fine. So as part of saving the world, we're just going to set the string. So then when we load the world, so we want to load the world back based on that. Right now, what does our load world button do? Well, it reloads our scene. That way we start with a fresh uh, thing with no garbage in there. And we set a flag in here that says load world equals true. And then when we reload our scene and on enable runs, it checks to see that load world flag. And then it, create, it calls create world from save file as opposed to create empty world. So create empty world is the normal one. It creates just a regular world of size 100 by 100 position the camera done our create world from save file right now is calling currently the empty constructor but that's probably not what we want to do we want to create a world with a particular size of coordinates well actually we don't want to do that at all we want to create the world from our save file data 
That's what we want to do. We want to create a world from our save file data. So what we're going to do is do something that's not dissimilar in setup from what our save world screen looks over here, looks like over here. Let's grab all this and do that. We are going to need an XML serializer for our world. And we are going to need, well, it's not going to be a text writer. We're going to need a text reader. And I think it's going to be a string reader over here. And do we have to, we can feed it a string. What string are we going to feed it? Well, we are going to grab, let me just copy this down here. So it'll be easier to read. We feed it in a string and we're going to say player prefs dot get string called save game zero zero. So we're going to get the string out of the player prefs. We're going to feed that into our string reader. That's going to set that up. And then we are going to deserialize from our reader to the world like this. Oh, no. Okay. First of all, this should be called reader. Secondly, we don't give it a world here. We instead, it returns world. And I think this returns a generic object, so we have to cast it to world over there. Reader.close, reader.toString. Hey, well, we can do that. Just to confirm that it's currently loading and properly. It's going to deserialize it and set our world from there. Now, this doesn't do anything right now. This should call in our model. This is going to call all the way down here. It's going to call read XML. Let's go ahead and put a debug dot log in here and confirm that read XML runs. Let's find out what happens with this. We're going to hit play. First, we are going to go ahead and hit save because this way it'll actually put something in our player prefs as opposed to just being an empty string. All right. So uh, theoretically, our player preferences have now been set. Now let's hit load, which should reload the scene. If I go and like just do this and then hit load, it'll get us to a blank scene and we're getting errors. That's OK. The errors are expected at this point. But we can confirm that read XML has been executed. You can see it right here. Read XML is definitely running right there. The reason we're getting errors is because at this after this is done, after read XML finishes running, we're supposed to have a world that's configured and we don't have that right now. We do have a world object. Okay, this deserialize instantiates an instance of world using the default slash empty constructor, this one here, which does nothing, and then calls read XML. So read XML is really going to have to do read XML or the empty constructor are going to have to do basically everything that our, our more typical constructor here for the empty world does. This constructor here is what normally creates our world and sets up everything that is supposed to happen for it. Um, the problem is the read XML one, at, when that's being run, we already have a world instance at this point. Now, some of these things could be moved to the default constructor, the job queue, different things like that. But obviously we can't, we won't know when the default constructor runs, we actually won't know what the width and height is yet. That We don't know that until we read our XML. Therefore, we can't create our tiles and so on and so forth. So I think what we need to do is we have to break this down a bit. There's two possibilities. Well, because what I'm thinking is, you know, we can move this stuff out of the constructor and instead have a secondary function, which would be fine, right? If we had a function called, um, you know, setup world with the int width, int height, like this. And let's say we grabbed all this for the sake of argument out of there. And so here, all we do is set up, call setup world with width and height, like that. Then we can call this function. Whoops, go away. There, that was annoying. We could call this function right over here. All we need to know is, you know, we need to know what those values are. Five, five or something, you know, just some other value, which is going to be read from the XML. And you know what? That's probably a fine start. Let's start with that. So we need to load at the very least at this point, we need to know what our height and width is. So at this point, we do have our XML reader and it's currently pointing to a node. It should be pointing to our world node, our world element inside of there. And we can find out, um, I think just reader.name, I don't remember, might return the name of the current element. Let's find out. 
Let's do that and run setup world for a 5x5 five five square, which is going to be okay. At least it'll, it'll not generate a bunch of errors anymore because it'll actually be doing that. Let's hit load. Yep, yeah, there we go. So right there where it says world, it's returning the current tag that we're pointing at, which is great. What do we need to read out of this? Well, we need to read the height and width. There's a few different ways to do that. Um, one easy way to do it is to grab reader dot um, get attribute, and then we just give it a name. Well, it can be an index, but the name is the easiest thing. So we can do this, for example, and this will return the string right in our XML over here. Width is equal to 100, but this is a string. One zero zero are the characters. It's not a number at this point. So this will return a string. And what you can do is you can feed this through, say, int dot parse. Int dot parse. There we go. Parse and try parse. Um, the difference between these two is I believe if int dot parse tries to parse a string, you know, like this, um, it'll return an integer, right? So int i or w is equal to this. This should result in this integer w having the value of 100. But let's say our string looked like, you know, it's not a number, right? Clearly not a number. Um, actually, I don't remember what this does. I know that try parse will return an exception. And what you could do is you could put it inside a block. Hang on, I might be getting this inverted here. I can't remember which one throws the exception and which one has it sort of implied and returns something else. Converts the string representation to its 32-bit integer and a return value indicates the operation succeeded. Oh, right, 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 right. Try parse, you don't doesn't return the value directly. You need to have the value ahead of time, int w, and then you feed it an out parameter of w, and this will return a boolean if it was successful or not. Whereas parse, if unless I'm wrong, don't do this a whole lot. Whereas the parse version just returns like this, but we'll throw an exception. You can wrap this around a try catch block try, blah, catch, whatever, and catch those errors. So what we can do at this point is you can say on a reader, you can get attribute width and then parse it and then, you know, do work around that using parse or try parse. That's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it, and I'm pretty sure this will work, um, is move to attribute. So internally, the XML reader has sort of a pointer. So we can move to an attribute at this point called width. And so now the current node, I mean, it'll still be on the world element, but specifically on the width sub element. And then we can use on reader, um, we can get um, it's one as in read content as int. Because, because we're pointing at the attribute, read content as int should return the content of width. Now this, uh, just like parse, I believe will return, will throw an exception if it's got a bad value. We'll probably put in some of that stuff later on. For now, I'll just assume this magically works or something. Um, width is equal to that. And then we'll go debug.log width plus width. And let's see if that does something vaguely right. Load width is equal to 100. Nice. And we're not setting width to 100 anywhere. Width doesn't have a default value. The only time it can get set is in the constructor over here. Yeah, I'd say this is probably working. And then we can just move to the attribute called height and load that in as well. And what we can do is we can set up world uh, no, as width height. So now we should have a 100 by 100 world, same as before, but read from this file. Hit play, hit load, read XML, world, world created with 10,000 tiles, right? Because I don't have the debug information in there. And actually we're still spitting out this name, which is not particularly um, handy. And let's rename this to world like that. So we'll get more text, but it's reading in the width and the height from our XML file and then setting up the world using that data. Okay, so that is a start. 
Now we get into slightly even more hairy stuff, which is the tiles. We want to persist the tile data, because right now we don't do that. If I were to hit play and say pathfinding test to populate it with stuff, and then hit save, we're only saving the width and height. We're not saving any of the tile information, which is why we hit load, we get a blank screen again. So how are we going to save the tile data? And this is, the tile specifically is one of the reasons. Yeah. How come I can't go to declaration? Buh, buh, buh. That's odd to me. Maybe it's getting confused because of the array. That's okay. Um, this The tile info is one of the big reasons why I want to um, do a bit of customization on the saving because just dumping the tiles as is, I think, would generate a ludicrously large file. Tiles don't actually need a whole hell of a lot of info. Um, in particular, assuming we don't have to save the furniture, if the furniture isn't part of the tile, but rather we have um, sort of an overall pointer to all furniture, and I don't think we've got that right now. It's actually a good question. We've got a, a reference to all furniture prototypes, but do we actually keep track of all furniture anywhere? Hmm, no, we don't. Okay, I may change my mind about something. Um, but, so the question is, do we have to save? So enter an XML over here. Do we want something that looks like tile, you know, tile, maybe it's got um, X equals, you know, it's at this coordinate and that coordinate, right? And then it's got you know, furniture and then it's got furniture data within it. That's one possibility. It does lead to a lot more per tile stuff. It makes a much bigger file, but it might be okay. The alternative is that we have some sort of like tiles info like this, which is some sort of quasi numeric string to just keep the flags going. And then after that, we have a list of um, furniture or something like that, or just a bunch of furniture items. And the furniture itself knows I'm at coordinate something, other coordinate something else, you know, and details about what, you know, what I am, etc, etc, etc. Damage. And so on. This would lead to a smaller file, and the fact that the tile, you know, the tile type in each place is sort of kind of indecipherable, I don't know if it's a big deal. Um, and so this is the sort of thing that you that you wouldn't have been able to get with the default um, serialization of the world data. And I think I'm kind of leaning in this direction because this is just the tile map. In fact, we might call it that, you know, tile map. Because the tiles, the whole thing is the tiles don't really have any data. They'll, and, and they should never really have any data. The only thing they should have is their type, and then some, furniture or inventory might be within that. And what about fire and things like that? I mean, there's a lot of things tiles can contain, but it doesn't mean it has to be subbed inside of that. So yeah, I'm kind of on the fence. Both ways are valid. I guess we'll go for maximum legibility. It'll be a bigger file, but it's hardly the end of the world. Might meant we could get away with a little bit less customization. That's okay. It's actually still not too bad because when we write the XML here, so what I'll do is we want to serialize all the tiles at that point. Um, I don't know if the serialization will correctly do the two-dimensional array size. I suppose we could give it a go and see what happens. Let's give it a go and see what happens, and then we'll move on from there, and that'll be okay. So in a writer, we're gonna we're gonna make a new, um, I guess, write node. Is that actually? No, I think we just want to create element, right? Yeah, yeah. Dot, um, oh, start element. Yeah, write start element. So we'll create a, an element called tiles like that, and we'll want to make sure to end write end element to close that out. But then we want to 
Uh, can I not send it a dot serialize for the sub info? Hold on, I was pretty sure because I only have the writer. I might have to create a new XML serializer instance. Well, there's two possibilities. If I don't know like how my tiles are implemented at this point, there's two things. I can assume I want to use a default serialization and then go there and and just use so and then create a new XML serializer and call XML serialize on tile using the same writer. Or what I can do is if this, hold on, we'll copy and paste a few things here just to save. Whoops. If our tile implements I XML serializable and therefore has uh, these same functions down here. Mm -hmm. And read XML, read XML with an XML reader and a reader. All right, if we have all those things, we're also going to need a, um, a a default constructor here. I don't remember if the tile has it. It might. Anyway, um, the whole point being that we can do something like loop through for each tile. So for x, which is less than width, and then for y, which is less than height, um, we can do something like tiles xy dot write xml and just pass the writer to it as long as we know you know as long as, as we're okay with the fact that okay this we we know clearly that serialize that we've um we implement i serializable otherwise the other thing we could do is instantiate a new copy of xml serializer and ask it to serialize the tile one at a time by passing it the same writer and then you, we could basically choose whether we're implementing i serializable or if we're just using the default one Pretty sure that's true. I don't think I'm lying to you, but I might be. It could happen. All right, let's do that. Write XML and what kind of data we want right here. For now, let's just go and write the type. That's it. Writer dot um, should be an attribute. Yeah, probably. Write attribute string, um, which is going to be called type, and the string value will be type dot to string. I guess we can do it that way. We'll have to see exactly what we want to do there. We could make it an integer. Because uh, the thing is, um, this the type is an enum. Yeah. is a tile type enum. And you can treat this uh, effectively as an integer. But we'll go ahead and output the uh, the name string. Again, it'll make our file much, much, much bigger. Um, but I guess that's fine. I'm a little bit leery about doing a dump to the debug log at this point. I'm not sure if our debug log can handle something quite this large because this is going to be ludicrously big. Um, I think we also need to writer and then you start a new element for called tile. And then we probably want to add two attribute strings on that tile for x and y and go tiles x comma y well i guess we know it's just x and y those will be attributes of that and then we write out its sub stuff and then we go um, end element we could also have moved this code within this Actually, let's let's do that. Let's assume like we're going to create the start and end elements in here. Again, with the serializer, the elements would have automatically been created. For example, we didn't have to create the elements for our um, for our world, uh, our world bra um, uh, element. But here, I think the way we're doing it, we have to. Let's give this a go and see what happens. Let's actually just have it go once, and then we'll break. Yeah, it's a good idea. Let's, as a default, we'll just have it write out one tile. That way it doesn't take forever to do it because this is going to be a relatively longer process. And we got some nice errors. Write attribute string, oh, dot to string, dot to string. 
an unreachable code. That's fine. So save. What's our XML look like? Can I copy? It's grayed out. I guess you still have to select. Let me grab this. Yeah, it's looking okay. And bring it in here. There we go. Tiles, the tile with the coordinate, which we may not actually need these in here, but it, it will make it easier for debugging. For loading, because we know that these tiles will be um, in this file in a certain order, we could just assume their coordinates going forward. But for some debugging, it's going to be okay. So that's, yeah, that's going to be in there. Um, and it'll loop through them all. So again, this would be an extraordinarily verbose file because it's going to have 10,000 lines of this, which means our save file is going to be, how many characters is this like? let's say 20, uh, so 10,000 times 20, so it's 200K of just tile info, which isn't actually that much now that I think about it. And again, we can shrink this down considerably later on. Uh, first of all, it compresses very well. Secondly, I think we can get rid of that bit. Thirdly, this could be turned into T equals and then a number because we can treat our, um, our enum as an integer instead of a string. In fact, I'm not sure about reading from a string to an enum. We might actually, this might not actually work. We're gonna to have to play that one by ear. But we are we are working on that, which is a thing. Okay, let's go. Let's try to complete this. So instead of breaking now, we'll have it generate the entire file. That's going to be okay. Let's make sure that works as is. So I'll hit play. I'll hit save. Takes a second. There we go. Eh, wasn't too bad. And it definitely create. Oh, uh, I want to do um, pathfinding test. Save. There we go. And somewhere in the middle of this, it's going to see things that aren't empty. Message truncated. Oh, that's interesting. So the uh, the debug log actually gets cut off at some point. But the string should actually be in there. Okay, it's actually good the debug log gets there. Assuming the user prefs are all um, doesn't get truncated. There's got to be another way to spit this out to the end user. I guess I could find the actual save file on the hard drive, but well, let's let's just flip it around. Let's do the reading. So this is the world reading. It's going to load in its width and its height. It's going to set up its world, um, which is going to create a bunch of empty tiles at this point, set up all the callbacks and everything, which is going to be fine. And now we're going to go and read in all of the tiles. So we are going to, um, well, I guess first what we're going to do is reader dot move to element called tiles and then we actually don't need to loop this way I mean we can we don't have to I mean really what we're gonna do is loop through all of the tiles so for I in reader dot um, not attribute count Move to element, and it's got a boolean. Does this return if it was successful? Because I think this moves to the next one. Hang on. Where's my reference? Bum, bum, bum. Move to element. Uh, moves the element that contains. Moves to the element that contains the current attribute node. Okay, so that moves uh, out of the attribute back to the element. Which I don't know if we have to do that before we do this. I don't think so. And then let's move to element with a name. Doesn't it? Hmm. Move to. Move to attributes, move to element, move to the element that owns a current attribute. So how do we get the next one? Sibling. Read to next sibling. Advances the XML reader to the next sibling element with the specified quantified name. Yeah, okay, there we go. That's the one we want then. Move. Uh, no, read to next sibling of a name. And it seems to return a Boolean, which probably tells us if there's any more of it. Turn type, true if a matching sibling is found, otherwise false. Perfect. So instead of looping this way, we can then say, um, while reader dot read, or not sibling, we actually want to go into a child.
read start element. Let me check that. Sorry, again, I don't have a million pieces of experience with this particular library. So just remembering or knowing what all the function names are is a little bit. Check the current node is an element with the given an advance of the reader to the next node. This is not a helpful description of this text. Checks that the current content node is an element with the given local name. And, oh, they, hold on. I think I opened up the wrong version of this. Just the single string version, please. Advances the XML reader to the next sibling element with the specified qualified name. Oh no, that's read, hold on. Read start element is the one I want. That's what I'm doing wrong. Looking at the wrong one. Checks that the current node is an element and advances the reader to the next node. Is this gonna be within though? Child. Oh, read to descendant. That's what I want. Reader dot read to descendant. So we want to move to the first tile within that. And while reader dot advances the next descendant element, great. And then we want to loop through those. And while it is a start element of name tile, we loop, and then in the loop we go uh, next read to next sibling called tile, which technically returns a boolean. I suppose we could break there, but that should be fine. Okay. We make sure that we're on a start element called tile, and then we loop through that. And then what we do is we set, we get some values out of this. I mean, we can just sort of assume, but int x is equal to reader dot uh, attribute. So get attribute with the name of x. And well, we could advance to it again. I guess that'd be fine. So we're gonna read the attribute called x sort in a variable called x, do the same thing for y, and do the same thing for tile type, type, oops, read content as, I don't suppose you have a read content and enum, there's no way, yeah, content, I mean, it's just a string. I don't know if there's, yeah, there's an as string there. Can we, can we cast this to a tile type based on a matching string? I don't expect that to work. I expect us to have to, yeah. I expect we're gonna have to save this as an integer instead. So um, our type, we wanna send it to an int. We're just gonna cast our current type to an integer which should mean that our text file contains numbers of 0, 1, and so on and so forth. And so here we can read the content as an integer, which can be cast to a tile type. Doo -doo -doo. So yeah, cast it to a string or to an integer, then go to string. So we'll get a numeric version of that. So let's give it a little play here. Pathfinding test and save. Take a look at what that looks like. Yeah, type equals zero, so that should be fine. So then when we are then um, reading the data here, actually, I don't have to read that here. I'm doing this wrong. Well, ish. This is all code that belongs here. X, Y, and then finally my type is equal to that. So we move to the correct tile and then we say, oh, we need to get a coordinates. That is the issue. Hang on. Type. Uh, I guess it's fine there. We need to get int x 
and int y over here. So we know to say tiles x y dot um, what's it called? Read XML dot read XML from the reader, and then we go to the next tile. Okay, let's see how that works. Hit play. Our, our save file should be fine. If we hit load, hmm. It's called world s. We create the tiles. But are we looping through here? And I think we need um, we need some debug info. Debug dot log uh, reading tile. This is going to be really slow when we run it. Plus x comma or plus comma plus y. Load. Ooh, it's not. Because world read XML is running, but none of that is looping over here. So I've got a slight glitch in that. And again, I was sort of hesitating with some of these, and I clearly uh, done goofed it. Um, read to descendants. So debug.log reader.name. So I'm suspecting we're not going to be at the correct node at that point. Nowhere to blank node. Despite the fact that that's our texture, so. Oh, it's because we're reading to the symboling here, but that's not right. We want to read to our descendant tiles, and then our descendant within that called tile. It's getting my structure wrong. This is saying that we are at a node called height. Oh, because we were stuck on the attributes. So hold on, we got to back up after that. Reader dot uh, move to elements. We got to bop back to the element as opposed to the attribute, and then we can should be able to start advancing again. If need be, we'll put in a cut here, and then we'll resolve this next time. Oh, this load is taking a really long time to run. That's probably a good sign. Although maybe I should have uh, put a break in here after the first loop because this is taking very long. Now, most likely it's taking very long because of all the debug commands that are going out. It's almost certainly what is just crushing things. So what I'll do is I'll go and put a break there. And I think actually by recompiling this, which is what's going to happen when I save. No, it's Unity is still going to be just locked. It's because it's spamming out so much to the debug log. What I think I'll do is I'll force kill it. Boop. No offense, Unity. And then we'll run that again with that break. So it'll only load one tile. And we'll see exactly what that does. Hit play. Hit load. Reading tile 00. zero. Excellent. So it did successfully read one or tried to. So let's remove this debug information. Still possible that this will take forever. But let's find out. Now if we hit play and we hit load and we don't have all that debug in there. Boom. It runs quite quickly but does not have a very interesting world. Let's make sure, pathfind test, save, new world, load. Okay, and it's not, it's not actually reading in the type, or it has something to do with the order in which some of the callbacks might be being called. It's possible that our callbacks aren't firing. We're going to check that out. There's a lot of work, and I'm, I'm thinking this is still probably, in the end, a bit sloppy over here. I don't like that we're having to progress through things quite so explicitly, but we'll see what we can do to improve this going forward. But this video has gone way too long as is. Thanks for watching. We'll keep working on our files, saving and loading next time. See you next time, folks. Bye-bye. Thank you very much to all our January supporters over at patreon.com slash willykingcreates and these mic check supporters. We've got Alexander Gutler, Andre Odendal, Neil Blakely Milner, Speedy Savant, Valiant Cake Fiend, Aaron Toyson, Marius Field Vold, Disco Geek, Ole Peter Talgo, Julian Auger Lafont, or Auger Lafont, I should say, Steven Stagger, Michael McClintock, Kale the Quick, Drazion, Wes Oldenboving, Craig Mortel, Nail or Nale, 
I don't know, Vickstrom and Andrew Henninger and everyone who has watched, shared, favorited and subscribed to these videos and left comments as well. You guys really keep things going. Thank you very much for watching.